Hello, brothers and sisters of the Charlotte Church. And for all of you who are visiting with us, uh, listening to uh, this virtual uh, broadcast or uh, today, uh, my name is Rodney Fuller. Uh, this is uh, Ron Drabo. We are both uh, evangelists here with the Charlotte Church, uh, servants of nearly 500 disciples here. We're so glad that you have chosen today uh, and this time to listen to uh, what we're going to be sharing. Uh, we really, in light of everything that's happening today in our world, uh, racially, socially, uh, politically, we thought it really important to come together and uh, just talk about what's happening again in the world, but also how it deeply is affecting the church. And um, as disciples of Jesus Christ, that is foremost what we need to be looking at, uh, because as the church needs to be a light uh, to this dark world, uh, we see uh, people responding, reacting in so many different ways. Uh, but as disciples of Christ who make up Jesus' church, we need to show them, show the world, show our neighbors, show our communities, how do we really respond in a time like this? In a time of crisis, how do we respond to one another? How do we speak to one another, especially with those who have an opposing view? And uh, we want to be able to talk about times uh, or how we, we respond. And so that's what this talk is about. And it's only one of a series of conversations that we'll have uh, as disciples here in the church. Uh, we do want to have a cross section of, of those in the church that represent us and to get different thoughts, different perspectives, different feelings, different experiences. Uh, we'll hear from uh, the youth as well. And even those who are, let's say, more mature uh, in their walk uh, in life and in their walk with the Lord. So uh, I think we'll start off now with a prayer and then we'll jump right into the discussion. Okay, Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, uh, you obviously are the God who loves each one of us, the God who has created each one of us and the God who is working in each one of our lives. Father, we want your love, your guidance, uh, Father, your wisdom uh, to be in our lives and in our hearts as, Father, we try and strive uh, to give glory to you mm -hmm. as we strive, Father, to uh, really advance your kingdom and the love of Jesus uh, in this world. Father, we know it is hurting we know uh, there's a lot of pain um, and a lot of suffering. And uh, Father, we are praying at this moment that uh, you will work to heal our hearts mm -hmm. as each one of us uh, looks to see, Father, how we can be more like Christ, Amen. how we can change uh, in order to, to bring about reconciliation and to bring about unity mm -hmm. and to bring about the oneness of heart and mind that you desire for all of us to have mm -hmm. in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, Father, uh, we ask that you guide our time and be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You know, as we uh, start off, we thought uh, it'd be good to have you look at a couple of video clips uh, concerning what empathy is really like. Uh, so we'll be right back, but take a look at these two videos. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then 
we look and we say, hey, you can climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no. You want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So as you saw from those two videos, hopefully your heart was really moved. I think both of them did a really great job of, yes, pulling at our heart. But I think the explanation is really how far are we willing to go to try and experience what each other is feeling? Um, because we really don't know different people's experiences, especially if we never have a conversation. And in the church, if we're going to, again, really be the light of the world, um, we need to be able to have both empathy and compassion. And empathy is, uh, many have said that empathy is, a, 
is kind of a gateway into compassion. Um, you can have empathy without having compassion, but you can't have compassion and not have empathy. Um, but with empathy, it's really uh, putting yourself in a place where you can understand what another person is actually feeling, to really put yourself in their pain or their struggle or their issue. Um, and I can see why it says that it's a gateway uh, because the more we can relate to people and feel what they're feeling, right. then it helps us to, to understand, okay, so I see why you got to that, that place. Um, but you're also trying to think back at, okay, different experiences that you have had in order to place yourself there. Um, but having empathy and compassion doesn't put yourself first. You're actually second because you're really trying to understand a person. Uh, and it's a, again, it's a mode of relating to one another. Now, compassion, um, you, you feel what that other person is feeling. You hold on to it. You process it. You even accept it. But now what you're trying to do is figure a way to take that away or to help a person deal with it right. and so it's like picking a person up and saying hey I'm gonna walk with you through this and let's see how we can get this reconciled or how we can deal with this this pain or this this issue and when we can get there now we're actually walking with people and building relationship and I mean that's after all what Jesus did exactly. right and so here's here's where you know Ron as as I've been looking at this you know looking at empathy and compassion, listening to what, how it's affected different disciples in the church, I think we're in an incredibly challenging time. And it's challenging because the world handles things in a certain way. Right. And uh, there's all of this, this anger, there's this venom, um, there's this outrage from all sides. And, and I can, I, I get it, you know, even from, you know, different perspectives, um, but I think the, the, the challenging thing in the church, though, is who are we really listening to? Where, where, is our, where is our compass? Who is our guide as we hear these types of things? And I think if we're not careful uh, as a church collective, but as individual disciples, if we're not careful, this church will be torn apart. Uh, churches across our fellowship will be torn apart because we don't really understand each other, because we're not striving to be reconciled with one another. And it's, it's like a, a forming of all types of storms converging on one another. Right. So we have, of course, none of us expected and thought that COVID would shut down, you know, kind of our, our way of life, you know, for three months you know, the way that it has, but it has obviously meant so many deaths, um, but it's also meant that we can't have this physical connection with, with one another. So this stay at home order, you know, safer at home. Then we have the political climate that, you know, we're facing and, and we are in an election year. But then we have the whole racial issue that has come upon us that it's not, it's not like it's come out of nowhere. I mean, this has always been, you know, plaguing the, the world. But in our nation, it has come up again. And so now we've got all these different things that are happening and people are tired, people are angry, they're exhausted, they're tired of being, you know, at home, uh, can't go any place. And Satan knows this, you know. What, 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 how, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think uh, what you're saying there, Rodney, you know, um, to understand as a disciple that the real battle, you know, is not flesh and blood, mm -hmm. okay? That it's, it's the demonic forces, it's the spiritual authorities, the rulers, you know, in the heavenly realms, right. you know, that are actually working on us. And, and the way that they work, uh, honest through all this time, obviously, is to um, get us to focus on the wrong things, and um, you know, and get us to fight 
even against some of these things that we're feeling, you know, from a worldly perspective. And God says, you know, that um, we don't fight with weapons of the world. You know, we have to we have to fight differently. We have to look at uh, really the the word of God. We have to let God's word. We have to let Jesus's rule, Jesus's love. We have to let uh, the kingdom rule in our life Mm -hmm. and uh you know and not allow you know satan to take us um into these uh other areas that may uh that may really distract us and and uh get us away from what we really need to be looking at you know and so looking at that our real enemy our, our, our real enemy is is not each other you know it's satan who's trying to divide us in our hearts and in our minds um you know, Rodney, with, with everything, obviously, that people are feeling and going through, um, and, and people have experienced this, this pain, this hurt, mm-hmm. you know, for a long time uh, in our country. Um, but why do you think that at this time, you know, the killing of George Floyd has sparked worldwide outrage? You know, that's a good question. Um... I think it, it, it was a straw. And again, I'm from my, just my perspective. I think it was the straw, if you will, that broke the camel's back, so to speak. I think it was a, a straw of, of a billion other straws that finally it was like, okay, what in the world? You know, I even have thought that um, we could even take race out of it, but but, you know, to, to, to answer your question, I think people seeing the video, seeing the, the officer place his knee on, on George Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds, that a grown man crying out for his dead mother, for me... Uh, and for many in 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 my culture, you you cry out for your mother when it's when it the situation is like hopeless. That's when you're crying out for your mom. And to hear a grown man cry out for his mother, for many uh, black people, it was like, oh, he knows he's at the end. He knows, and then you've got people actually watching this man probably take the last breaths ever on, on, on earth. So they, they see him struggling for life, for air, and then they see his body become lifeless. And I think that was a, I think that was a straw, you know? Um, and, but then the, the other thing that drove it even more was I think the look on the officer's face. I think the look on the officer's face for many and even me was was blank with any depth of feeling and emotion for another human being. And I think going back to what I had said earlier, I could even take race out of it. Let's let's say George Floyd wasn't black. Let's say he was white. Let's say he was Asian. Let's say he was, you know, native Indian to watch a person's life just leave them like that. And an officer having that type of look on his face, I think that communicated so much. I think that's why it sparked such, such outrage. You know, what's, what's interesting though, and I think this is part of, as, as blacks and whites are, are trying to have this, this dialogue, um, but I also think for for any ethnicity of, 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 of person that wants to have a dialogue in terms of race and everything, I think is what is our perspective when we think about racism? What's, what's the lens we're looking through? Um, and I heard someone say this, and I wish I could remember who said it, but they said, you know, black and white people generally view racism from a whole different lens. And it said that that when white people think about racism, they more think about racism today. Yeah. 
Whereas when black people view racism, they're putting together a string of history of what's happened through time up until today. And if, if those two perspectives can't find a way in the discussion, if we can't understand, okay, we view this from a different lens, we will never come together. We'll never really hear each other. Both have a place. Um, but if we can't understand that perspective, then we'll always be passing each other and never really developing a, 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 an understanding and a, a union you know, together that, okay, now we can actually you know, walk you know, together. But um, I, think, I think those are you know, some, some things there. Again, that's my, that's my perspective as I, as I think about it. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, for me, um, when I think of that, I think it was, it was the perfect storm. Um, you know, like we talked about, uh, with so much going on, you know, with the pandemic, uh, you obviously had everybody has been locked up inside, mm -hmm. you know. Um, they've almost, they had to focus, you know, uh, on it. Um, and I think, uh, I think with the pandemic and then being able to see that, I think for, I think for people, it went from uh, being political, you know, to being a humanity. Mm. You know, uh, I think before people would always talk about, you know, the racism and uh, well, that's they'd almost view it, you know, in a in a political way. And I think that seeing, you know, that video and watching it. Um, which I couldn't, I, I couldn't even watch, uh, you know, the, the last, last part of it. I just, it, it was so painful, it, uh, you know, to see that, like you said, to see uh, a grown man um, crying out for his mom, not able to breathe, um, you know, just gasping for air and, and begging for help. And this particular situation where he kept his knee, you know, on his neck, and even after, uh, you know, the man apparently, you know, stopped moving, and maybe even at that point was had died, um, and just leaving it on there for a few more minutes. Um, I think that just. You know, like I say, this this is not about politics. This is this was a human life, you know, that was taken, and and we watched it. And we, you know, we watched it, and and like you said, you know, I th you know, I think people, um, you know, you're right. I think people can view the uh, racism as either an individual act, or people view it through the lens of, you know, history and experiences. In fact, you know, I think all of us, we either experience racism, uh, uh, I mean, we come to know racism, I should say, either by our experience or by our exposure, you know? And, and so if you've experienced it, you know, in your life, I mean, obviously that's real and that's hurtful and, and it affects you. Others haven't. And so they don't have this history, you know, and, and so they don't have this feeling, you know, that we're talking about the, you know, to feel somebody else's pain because they're, they're just viewing it from theirs where I didn't have, didn't have experience to it, mm -hmm. you know. So then the other way is, is, is exposure, if you've seen it. And, um, and then, you know, if you've been exposed to it and, uh, I, you know, for me, uh, Rodney, it's like, uh, you know, the exposure that, that I had, uh, you know, being in South Africa and um, going there during a time, leading a church uh, that was during the time of, of apartheid uh, when uh, Mr. Mandela was still in prison. Uh, and uh, I remember going uh, to South Africa and people asking, well, what are you going to do? Because 
apartheid's on the books mm -hmm. and it's against the law right for blacks and whites to even uh worship together right to live together and all of that and i said well but we're obviously you know we're going we're going to worship together mm -hmm. you know that's that's uh god's word i says we'll see what happens mm -hmm. you know um but at that time when when i had got there uh it also was kind of like they were almost turning their, their back away, you know, uh, allowing some things if they did not view you as political, you know. And um, so they allowed us to be together. But the exposure that, that I had then to see up close what it was like um, for someone to be mistreated, for someone to, to be looked down upon, for someone to not have the equal rights. I, 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 I remember just riding in the car with uh, with a uh, African brother, and uh, and uh, as we were riding along, he became you know one of my uh, very special friends. But he was just smiling from ear to ear as we were riding in the car. We had a little moment of silence, and and so I, I looked over and I said, I said uh, "Brother, what you know? What's so happy? You got to let me in on that." Mm -hmm. I said, "You're you're having some incredible thought." And as he shared, he, he, it, it just really took me back. Um, he said, uh, Ron, I'm just so happy that you and I are, are close friends and that I'm riding in the front seat with you. <laughs> wow. And, uh, wow. That really... just, you know, moved me and shook me. And so, you know, for me to uh, experience that, you know, to be exposed to that, just, you know, was, that, that, that was life-changing. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, I mean, there were so many stories, uh, Rodney, I mean, I, I talked with uh, different brothers one brother who um, was mistakenly picked up in the middle of the night, taken from his home, three, four in the morning. Uh, and he was taken out of bed, you know, with his wife and uh, his children in the home and uh, put into the police car and they were gonna take him down to the police station because they had suspected that he had been involved in some type of, of uh, rioting or political mm -hmm. activism or something and, mm -hmm. and um, as he was in the in that back seat of the car uh, you know, they stopped at a coffee shop and literally went inside uh, to have a coffee didn't tell him anything you know and left the door uh, the back door open you know, mm. and so, you know, he, he really had to think at that moment. He was wrestling and, you know, like, what, what should I do? What should I do? Should I, should I make a run for it? And he was just thinking, you know, mm -hmm. you know, that, it, I mean, he, he wasn't involved in that. Right. It was, okay. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as he thought about, you know, he wrestled and, you know, and he's, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stay put. I don't know what's going to happen to me afterwards, but I'm but I'm not going to run right? because, you know, there was obviously a, a setup there to with the door open. Right. That if he ran. I'll you know, really mess up if I do this one. Yeah. Yeah. So giving them uh, an excuse. Um, and, you know, he shared with me just how he had to overcome. Uh, I mean, there's. And by the way, this is a very special brother. He uh, he uh, actually became an elder in the church wow uh, uh in uh, in johannesburg and uh just a tremendous man and with with great love and great forgiveness uh in his heart um but again over and over i hear these stories you know uh and you know it just it helped me you know going back to uh to understand you know and to have more of the empathy uh and the uh, the compassion, you know, uh, for people when, when I could hear their story. Mm -hmm. And I think how, 
how important that is uh, that as brothers and sisters, you know, that we really can show the world, you know, love uh, as Jesus really wants us to show love right. uh, as he calls us to and to have that empathy, you know, for each other by listening right. to each other and hearing their story and embracing that, right. you know, um, because like I say, either you've experienced it or you'll be exposed to it or you need to have it, I should say, explained to you. Right. And that's going to be so vital, I think, to not allowing Satan, you know, to look at each other as the enemy mm -hmm. and to not uh, attacking this from a, a, a worldly perspective uh, is to really listen and get to know and hear your brothers. You know, you, you, you mentioned that. Let, let's um, I want to go ahead and read um, about viewing each other properly. Uh, and so here in 2 Corinthians 5, right? So um, I'll just read a part of it. But he says, um, let me get here. So and, and out of the my version, I, I just happen to be to get this new English Standard Version Bible that I wanted to get a different, you know, perspective and read on it. But so in, here in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 16, uh, Paul says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him this way no longer. And he goes on to talk about, you know, we're, we're, we're new. But he, he's, he talks about this not viewing each other from the flesh right. or from a worldly point of view, right? And so one of the most concerning things to me, I mean, I, I definitely am, am, am hurt by how, you know, we're seeing what's happening in the world and uh, in the, in the rage that's happening there. Uh, but as, as, as a disciple also, and this is, you know, as a black man, as an evangelist, as a disciple, I'm like, boy, what? I've really got to get my heart and emotions in check uh, because my identity is first with Jesus. Right. Right. But how do I deal with that? And, and um, I still have this, you know, this 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 emotional connection with with what's happening to 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 a number of people in in my race my that are the same color as me but in the church we've got that feeling we've got brothers and sisters who are white that um feel guilty that uh some feel like they're being put in a place to have to apologize for being white we've got black brothers and sisters who uh, are like, hey, we have to speak truth to power and you need to listen and hear and understand. We've got, um, of course, uh, physically challenged, you know, brothers and sisters. Uh, so we've got these. And then, uh, then again, people from different um, cultures right. and races who all have their own story also. We've got brothers and sisters who don't believe in white privilege, who believe they're white and they feel like, you know, I, and there's some blacks that feel this way, but it's like, I don't, I don't have white privilege, I don't believe in white privilege, and don't believe that it really exists. Well, that's a hot button for many other blacks that think, well, you, you don't believe that there's white privilege? And so we have all this stuff going on. And, and, the, and again, getting back to it, the thing that concerns me is that if we don't allow Jesus to be our compass, then we will be divided. We, there'll be people that leave the church. Uh, there'll be people that'll be so frustrated that, uh, again, that they leave the church and, and, and hey, I, I'm going to go somewhere else. Because we're making too big of a deal, you know, out of out of these things or it's happening to other people as well. And there's when we don't have 
the empathy and compassion, we'll never hear each other. Right. And, you know, we're fielding all types of texts, emails, things on Facebook and, and other platforms and, and social media. And it, it is so hard for, I think, too many Christians to understand what's actually taking place here. That Satan is in the center of all of this chaos that he is trying to divide and in many cases he is being successful even in the church when there's when there are disciples that will write each other off because of their stance racially even politically they've lost there's there's disciples now that will take stands that have that have that have written a line in the sand I, I am not going to hear this or I'm not going to believe this. And they've written a line in it saying where Jesus doesn't. Right. And, and so this question about what would Jesus really do is at an all time high. What would Jesus really do? What would Jesus, how would he really respond? And I, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, I think from, and here's where we could play kind of, advocate on either side, right? I think for black people that hear white people say there is no white privilege. For me, I think, okay, if that's where your stance really is, it makes me think that you're negating then years, uh, you're negating 200, over 200 years of slavery. You're negating that. You're saying then that maybe not that it didn't exist, but for you to say that there's no white privilege, you're ignoring that there was privilege that white people had during the time of slavery. Right. It, in many blacks' mind, black people's minds, that's obvious. Well, let's go to the days of Jim Crow. Let's go to the days of when you were uh, you, whether you're black or white, you're in the city or in the town and you want to go to the bathroom where well, you see black only, white only. The white bathrooms were good bathrooms. The black bathrooms, most of the time, nine times out of ten, were disgusting or not well manned or the plumbing didn't work. This was common. Well, let's say black only schools, white only schools. It goes on and on. And it's like, well, you, do, do you not see that as privilege? Since many, if not most black people view racism from an historical point of view over time is how they view it. Um, and so there's there's this this uh, negating that brings up to mind. Well, even let's say the the Indian who was native to this land before anyone else was here. Yeah. That race of people are all but wiped out. And I'm, I feel horrible for them. Their their race is racked now with uh, alcoholism, depression, suicide. Was there no white privilege there? That's, that's where the dominance came from. So if there is a dominant race, there is privilege. Yeah. Whether we like it or not, that when there is a dominant race, if all races really are equal, then you don't have any race that's really dominant. And you know, hey, we, but that's not how our world, op our world operates. That's not how the country operates. And there's different parts of, of the world that, that there is a dominant race. Right. When you have anyone that's dominant, that dominant race or person has privileges that the one who is not dominant does not have. Right. Um, now, for, for what, what do you think about that? Well, I'll, I'll let you, yeah. um, what do you think there? Well, and that's why I believe it's so important uh, Rodney, that we have the uh, willingness and the heart to to sit and learn. 
you know, and to hear, hear that. Because like you said, I think, um, not all, but I think some whites will view, you know, racism through the, the lens of just uh, particular events or things that they see at that time or at the moment, okay. you know, versus, versus history, you know, and all that's gone on. And like you said, for, for people to understand that, you know, that this has been, this is not just, you know, these individual events, but it's been 400 years, you know, of, of slavery. I don't have, as, you know, my ancestors and my heritage that were slaves. I mean, we're only actually a few generations away, you know, from slavery and people owning people in this country. Um, if you can't see that there was an advantage there and a dominant culture there, um, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty hard to, to believe. But, you, but you've got you to allow yourself to, to, to learn to educate yourself and think. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll even hear people say, you know, well, the Emancipation Proclamation, right, brought freedom and an end to the slavery in, in America. Mm, yeah, but immediately, right, over the next 100 years, next century, really, to the 1960s, you know, we had the Jim Crow era and laws. And so, again, thinking back, why? And learning, being willing to sit, sit and learn and, and hear and, 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 and educate yourself and read. And because, I mean, why was there the need, you know, for a Civil Rights Act? Why was there a need in 65 for, you know, the Voting Rights Act? Why was there a need for the Fair Housing Act? People, it wasn't fair because because people did not have the same opportunities. Uh, but you, if you don't sit and listen, and you don't learn, or you're not willing to go back and 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 see, um, then you are just going to judge. Well, you know, I don't see it right now, or I only see these isolated situations, and and you don't understand. So I think that's why it's so important um, that all of my white brothers and sisters. You know, are willing to sit and listen, and hear, and educate themselves and learn. What would you What would you say? Cause, because, because, again, you know, talking about it from uh, a disciple's perspective. So, when I say that, that is uh, void of color, race, culture. When I say now, as as a disciple, now, right? So. But how, how do, as disciples, because we do have uh, white brothers and sisters and they feel this way, but how can black brothers and sisters be part of unity that doesn't just include, you need to listen to me? Because I do believe there are some black brothers and sisters that put white brothers and sisters in a box that communicate in such a way that uh, makes some white brothers and sisters feel like their life struggle or their, uh, what they experience on a day-to-day -day basis or what they ex have experienced over time is not important or not valid. Um, how, how, do, how, do, how do we have that type of of, of conversation what what can it, from your perspective what can black brothers and sisters do to help the discussion and not put just have brothers and sisters have to just sit and listen right does that make sense sure of course it does um, uh, I would think for one you know something that um, you know black brothers and sisters can do you know to help the white brothers and sisters is to not come in presupposing you know, and uh, already, you know, or prejudging, you know, uh, you know, their their white brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. You know, um, don't don't assume, and don't um, you know, come into it 
uh, and, and uh, you know, you, you mentioned it as well. I mean, and I don't hear that. I, I have not heard from anybody, but obviously one thing would be for sure is uh, to not make uh, whites feel guilty. I, I, I have not heard that, or I, I don't see that, but I think that's going to be another thing because, you know, you haven't seen what? That people are trying to make, you know, white people feel guilty, you know, in the, in the church, you know, for the past. I, I have. And it may, maybe it does. but I, I, I have heard from um, some whites, but in particular, I had a conversation with a white brother who um, was told something very strongly by uh, a black um, uh, by a black sister right. that um, and I, I purposely can't say now, you know, for, for different reasons, what what was said. But but in his and my conversation, I felt I felt horrible for him. And I said, bro, I'm so sorry. You, you, you did not need to hear that. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I do think there is a reaction from black brothers and sisters as well. Reaction versus response that um, though I understand the historical perspective, I understand where it comes from, we have to say, I though am a disciple of Jesus Christ and everything that I feel and think and want to say has to come through the lens of Christ. As we just read here, we can't view each other anymore from the flesh, right? right? So that, in, in my mind, which is which is the struggle, you know, you know, for me, because I feel things as a black man. Right. But the spirit and as I read the, the God's word, it, it pulls me back to if I have any hope of helping other people, if I have any hope of being right with God, I have to allow this God's word to be my compass, period. Um, so any, anyway, I, I kind of interrupt you only to say that, no, there, there are things being said out there that make, make some white brothers and sisters feel guilty. Yeah. And, um, but then, and here's, here's, this is why it's so challenging, right? But I think there's ways that, that the way white brothers and sisters can say certain things, it's like totally negates what, what some black people feel. Right. And so we have this storm that just swirls around us. And again, Satan is right in the middle. And, and here's where I want to really uh, appeal to every disciple, regardless of what their, their color is or their ethnicity, is to be really be empathetic and compassionate. And, but it, 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 it's exhausting, yeah, right? It I, I know there's there's brothers and sisters who I've heard say this. I've heard blacks say it that are not in our fellowship, that I'm tired of explaining to white people why black people feel the way they feel. I'm tired of explaining myself. I'm tired of it. Yeah. There's a part of me that gets it. But as a disciple of Jesus Christ, yeah. you can't go there. You can't let that rule you. Did you think Jesus ever got tired of explaining? He did miracles. In front of the 12, they saw this. He did miracles in front of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, other religious leaders. Miracles that they knew this can't happen unless God is, is with you. And they still wouldn't believe. Right. I'm like, did Jesus ever get tired? He's fed 5,000 men. So you would think that feeding 4,000 to the disciples would be no big deal. Oh, we've been here, man. We know we, we Jesus. What? How, how you want to handle this one? Hey, maybe we should do it. With a, let's do it with a blade of grass this time. They still had a hard time. So, yeah, Jesus got tired. I think, but if we, if we're gonna call people back to Jesus, we um, we can't do what Satan wants us to do right we've got to go all the way we can't we got to get the strength from the spirit and say i'm going to have another discussion 
I'm going to take the time and have another discussion. But, you know, another thing that this has brought to my mind is the incredible need, not just dialogue, but for more prayer and more fasting. And um, because this is bigger than us. And, And I don't I don't we can't let anything get in the way of of Jesus's church. We can't allow ourselves to be divided. If the world's going to be divided, let them be divided. If, we're, if the world is going to be divided politically, and we're in an election year, so we think social media is a, a big deal, oh, it's getting ready to go down, <laughs> right. right, on Facebook and other uh, social media platforms. Where are we going to be as disciples? You know, so anyway, that's a, that, 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 that's a, a, a big thing in terms of how I think we we need to to be, but you know Jennifer mentioned something to me about our small groups, mm-hmm. and and you and I were discussing how the importance of why family groups or our small groups need to be able to have this level of discussion, right. but many of them don't know how, right? Many of the leadership doesn't know how uh, in 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 those groups. And many of the disciples themselves don't know how to handle conversations like that, right? Or aren't prepared to handle situations like that. Maybe you can speak a little bit because uh, we, we have some, some, um, some tips, if you will, that we're going to share in a little bit. But, but maybe you could share before we get into that why, why you think it's important that small groups are able to have those, those discussions. Well, I definitely think that it's crucial uh, for the advancement of the kingdom and uh, really for the love of Christ, you know, to be spread. I mean, that we have these talks. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about in the Bible, in in Ephesians 3, when Paul is telling us uh, about uh, all of our spiritual blessings in Christ and what we have in the church. Mm -hmm. He says in Ephesians 3 that uh, the manifold wisdom of God is is made known, Mm. right? Uh, Through the church, (laughs) through the church, that we will actually teach all of the spiritual beings, you know, both good and bad, you know, both uh, angelic and demonic, you know, in, in that spiritual world, that mm. we're going to be those teachers of, of, of showing the wisdom of God, the power of God, and the greatness of God, okay? And obviously, we're also going to be able to show the world, okay? The world will know we're His disciples, right? By our love for one another. So I think it's so crucial to have these talks, you know, in the church, in small groups, uh, that we have it on that level, uh, because just what you said, I think you have people, wow, I'm tired of trying to explain, you know, uh, to, to one particular people, and, uh, and you have others like, I don't want to, you know, get involved in that, or I don't want to discuss that, or I don't think we need to, that, you know, no, you know, we all need to give and, and sacrifice and push ourselves and extend ourselves to be able to care enough, you know, to let's have these conversations, let's understand each other. Mm -hmm. And through that, you know, I hope and pray that that would even draw us closer. That would permeate the whole church. And that would be such a message of, you know, Christ's uh, power and wisdom. We know, right, that the barrier of hostility was, was broken down, right? at the cross Mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. jesus his blood right is what uh brings all of us together and 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 breaks those walls down and it's in the church Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know that that love has got to be seen felt in a real way yeah and by having those talks yeah um this is uh why i believe you know um it's it's that way of showing christ's love um that we care enough to hear each other, mm-hmm. listen to each other, understand each other, yeah, you know, and and be with each other and yeah. stand with each other, 
yeah. as a result. Um, so it's, it's vital and important um, that we that we just don't talk about right love right, but that we demonstrate it right. It's action, and so that's why it should happen. You know, it it makes me think of <clears throat> this discussion I had, this conversation I had with the brother. Um, and I've shared this, you know, on Sundays before, but he texted me a, you know, pretty strong uh, text. It wasn't sinful, but it was definitely strong. It was, it was one that I had to get ready for. You know, you have a conversation and you know somebody's feeling pretty strong. You got to get ready emotionally and mentally, you know, to have this conversation. Right. And so I was having a, you know, prayer time. Uh, this was in the evening. And so I said, God, I'm, I'm going to give this brother a call. And can you please be with both of us, you know? And so I give him a call, and as soon as he answered the phone, I knew something was different, you know. But I thought, okay. And it was clear from the time he texted me to the time we were able to have a conversation, the spirit had been working. He took it upon himself to talk to some other black brothers that he is close to or that he knows. And that, those conversations gave him a different perspective. And he shared that. He said, I, I'm in a different place. Uh, I feel like I need to listen more than I need to talk. Now, here's what was interesting, though. So I was encouraged by that. But at the same time, I knew he still, though, has things on his heart. Right. It wasn't like everything he thought changed. And so I knew at that point I still need to give him an avenue to share what he thought regardless of how different it was than what, what I think. And so I said, brother, I said, look, your thoughts and, and, and your perspective is still important. I still want to hear what you're thinking and feeling. And so he began to, to share those things with me. And so we were able to have uh, share our different perspectives. Um, and and it, it did bring us closer together. But I wanted him to know it wasn't like everything he felt was, was wrong. And I wanted him to know that I wanted to hear it. And the other thing I shared with him, I said, we have to get to the point in the church and as disciples that you, white brother, may and will have some things that are on your heart that you have to get out. Right. That you have to say that you have to ask that may hurt me. But I have to have enough humility and love for you to know that you got to get that out. Right. And the same goes in the other direction. I, as a black disciple, may have some things that I feel and think that I've got to say that may hurt you. That you won't like. That you may be surprised by. But I've got to get them out and you've got to hear them and empathize if we are going to get unify and and let the word of God be the thing that brings us together and if we can't have that level of discussion that's hard but if we can't get there we can't show the world that Jesus Christ really does work and and that then when we say well Jesus is the answer then it'll always come across as a pat answer but how it comes to life is that humility, that I'm not going to go into this fighting you. Right. I'm not going to go into this, as you said, assuming. Right. I'm going to go into this thinking that you are a man that loves God first before your own opinion, before your own, you know, desires. Right. And if I can trust that and you can trust that, now we can have a conversation, even though it may hurt. But the goal is to get through this and let Jesus get the get the glory. Right. Exactly. And so I think it's probably a good time for us to share some of these tips. Okay. Right. So we, we we've got about five tips that we want to be able to share with you uh, as a small group to be able to set yourselves up for success in having a discussion. Yes. Now in the climate that we have now about race, about social issues, even political things, um, but this out this this actually outshines even race and politics. It's on it can go to everything. Um, but the first thing that we want to be able to share is 
is that when you go into some a conversation as a small group that you're dealing with some deep issues, some things that you know, okay, these are some controversial things. I think the first thing you need to do is set yourself up as a small group and say, you know what, before we have this discussion, we're going to pray and we're going to fast. We're going to pray and we're going to fast. And, 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 and I think it's important that disciples don't say, well, duh, yeah, we need to pray. I think we do that too much. And we don't give the, the honor to God that we need to be led by the Spirit. So I think, number one, to pray in a fast. But let me read some things to you about God's view about fasting out of Isaiah 58. In verse, uh, in verse 6, he says, Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. Now, that's powerful. Amen. Right. So th this type of fasting, we're, we're not thinking about ourselves, right. right? And so when we go into this fast, this type of fasting, we're thinking about how can God actually speak through me? How? So he talks about the poor that we're taking care of the poor, that our fasting actually produces something bigger outside of ourself, right? He says um, uh, to let the oppressed go free. Mm -hmm. That if people are feeling oppressed, I, man, how can I help you be free? You feel locked up. How can I help you be free? This is where the compassion comes in, right? right. He says, uh, break every yoke. Right. So if you're under a yoke and we're not talking about the yoke of Christ, but right. if you're under some yoke in the world, then that means you, you're restricted. Right. You, you're, you're locked up. And he says to break every yoke. So if we're breaking every yoke, I'm, what is it that you're restricted by? How can I break it? How can I help you break it so that you can be free and vice versa? Mm. Right. And what does God, God guarantees? He says, then you'll call and I'll answer you. He says, you shall cry and he will say, here I am. This is what we want to experience in the church. And, and when I think about that, I'm like, boy, that, that's exciting to be able to see God burst in. I mean, I, I long to see God's spirit fill his church where there's, you know, there's nothing else that can fit in here because God's spirit is filling it all. Yes. Right. Um, but number one, pray and fast. I think number two, uh, James calls us to this. Right. And in, in James chapter one, he says, beloved brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. Mm. And we've read that passage many times, yeah. but I think we've got to be intent. So we pray and fast, number one, yes. to get prepared with this type of, of, of thought in mind about why we're fasting, because this type of fast actually helps release people and give people freedom and liberation. Right. That's what Jesus or God is talking about. But then the part about being quick to listen that we go into this discussion wanting to hear what our brothers and sisters are thinking and what they're feeling. And so we're going into it first. We're, we're wanting to understand. Right. Why do you feel whether I agree with it or not? I want to understand. I want to do my best to understand. But the other one, though, is that I'm going in to respond and not react. I want to respond. That means, you know, we, we talked about Abraham. 
He reasoned. He used his mind. How, how can God work here? And he had been given something to do that was outlandish. And he still had to reason. So how, do, how we need to go into conversations. Okay, I need to listen. Yeah. I need to respond. And the only way I'm going to respond and not react is if I'm thinking through and my, my lens is through the eyes of God. So I think those are two uh, things that, that we can do. Yeah, and, and just to uh, jump on what you were saying there is in, about the, the power of that type of prayer and fasting, you know, please don't take that lightly, um, that we're just saying, go ahead and pray. Right. You know, go ahead and fast. And right. you share the, the type of fast that is pleasing to God with that heart mm -hmm. going into it. Um, but prayer is powerful. And, and we've got to uh, believe that, that the prayer of a righteous man mm. is powerful and powerful effective. And effective. Yep. So yep. believe that your prayer, that your prayers to God, God is going to lead mm -hmm. that discussion and he will lead your heart and he will lead the hearts of others. Yeah. And that God will hear that. He will answer that, you know, uh, and really hang on to that. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as uh, uh, when you were talking about going into listening, uh, you know, in the conversation and going into it to understand, you know, that is so important that in, in the, the rest of the, you know, when you think of James 119 where it says be quick to you know, slow to speak, right? Quick to listen and uh, slow to become angry. Yeah, yeah. You know, so we're telling you to go into this, you know, to have, uh, that's really a response. Right, Versus right. a reaction. Right. You know, um, so think about that and, and apply those things as you go into it. Mm -hmm. I think uh, thirdly, what's really, really important is uh, to set these uh uh, meetings up in these discussions is humility and um, you know God opposes the proud he gives grace to the humble yeah but he says uh, clearly in second Chronicles 7 he says if my people mm. okay, now obviously he's talking to his people there you know in the Old Testament and the Jews but now he's talking about us right okay so he says if my people will humble themselves. Yeah. Okay, and here's the power of it. God God will give us grace. Okay, we already saw that. But he says, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, okay, and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna get answers from God. Mm. And I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Okay. Mm. So being humble Humble yourself before God and be humble in those conversations. And part of that humility is going to be, I'm willing to listen and hear mm -hmm. my brothers and sisters share their heart and their feelings. Mm -hmm. We ought to be able to do that. Right. We ought right. to be able to share our hearts and our feelings. And, you know, in some cases, that may be really uncomfortable right. for some people to hear. Right. But if we go into it, you know, with humility. Um, I think that's going to be a, a very, very important part of these discussions. Yeah, yeah. Can I add to that? Yes, of course. Um, and I think, too, that, you know, that there's, there's a, and there may be some that are thinking this or wondering this, you know, this, as we go into these discussions, and this makes it even more challenging, but we're not talking about this discussion being one-sided. Right. So it's not that, white brothers and sisters should come to this group that or this time of discussion thinking, OK, all I can do is sit here and just hear what I need to understand or hear what I need to change or do or, or what have you. Right. Um, because that is exact. That's one sided. And I think if we're going to um, really build unity, it's a discussion. Right. right? And it's not going to it's not going to happen in one discussion. Right. 
It's not going to happen in one time we're sitting here. This is a journey that we're on. And there's going to be other things that come into play. Because, again, as, as we started here, we said have, framing our discussions this way um, really transcends any one topic. So it could be race. It could be economics. It could be social uh, things, um, education. It just, hey, this is what I'm feeling just in life as a person. Right. This is what I feel. Um, and it, 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 it should permeate everything in our life. So these discussions really uh, should be mutually beneficial. Absolutely. But if everybody came in, I'm going to be quick to listen. And slow to speak. Oh, and the other thing, that's why these groups have to be small. Yeah. It, it can't be 14, you know, and in some cases even 10 people trying to have this discussion. It's got to really be small and intimate so that we can really, really talk with one another. Right. So you were going to say something else. Well, there. yeah. The and, other thing. And also, I just to add on to that, I, not only should they be small, um, but uh, I would recommend, obviously, that they're diverse, you know, so, <laughs> right, right. Uh, got to be diverse sure that we are able to hear each other. Right, right. You know, um, and so, uh, no, I would, that's the main thing. Amen. 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 I think the, uh, the fourth thing that uh, we would recommend in, uh, in having these discussions in small groups um, is to understand that you're going into this conversation as a minister of reconciliation. Mm, that's major, major. That's, I think it's that's so crucial uh, that that's what we're going into having these talks. For. Mm. You know, um, you know. Obviously, we've been reconciled. You know, to God through the cross and the blood of Jesus. But Second Corinthians five tells us that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Yeah. We are all actual ministers. So going into these uh, uh, conversations, you are a servant, okay, of, of that individual that you're going into the meeting with, and our goal and our focus and our heart ought to be reconciliation. Right, right. Okay, and that, I think that is, is going to be vital to having a successful meeting, is that heart, yeah. that mindset. And that calling from God. Right. And we're letting God tell us how we need to have these talks. Right. You know, and we're letting God govern, you know, the words that come from our mouth. Right. You know, Ed Hampton and I, um, or Ed, I'll say, had this conversation with me, uh, I don't know, maybe a year and a half, maybe even two years ago. Um, we were right in the, in the sanctuary here and, and during fellowship. And he talked about, he, he had this enthusiasm uh, about being a minister of reconciliation. He was like, that's what we are. We, we are, we are uh, ministers of reconciliation. And I, I, as you were saying that, I, I started Ed, you know, in the conversation that I had with him. Um, but that's it, right? I mean, that, 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 sets, the, that sets the stage. If, if we're ministers of reconciliation, that means I can't draw a line in the sand. Right. I can't dig my heels in and say, well, I'm not going past this part because as disciples, we're given that, right? So right. we're given the message of reconciliation. Since we have that message of reconciliation, then we're ministers of reconciliation. And that, that's going to be interesting to see how we all handle that. Yeah. Because for those that have dug their heels in or those who have drawn lines in the sand, I'm only going to do this. That challenges them because I, I'm like, well, if we're going to if we're going to dig our heels in the sand, this is how far I go. I'm like, if you're going to dig your heels in the sand, if you're going to draw lines. You don't have the love of Christ in your heart. Because the love of Christ will rule over all of that stuff. Now, it, it can be hard, but that's that's the standard that we have to hold ourselves to. Let's, let, let the world, you know, draw lines. But the, you know, as we shared last Sunday, that the darker the world gets, the brighter the church must shine. Yes. You know, uh, so that, that, that's a great one. I think the last one that, you know, we want to share is this. We've got to give room 
for the process, right? We've got to give room for people to process this. I, I know I'm a big processor, and so especially when I deal with things that are heavy or, or that take up a lot of brain you know, uh, space, right. I've, I got to be able to process. And I think it's important that we give each other room to process because this is a journey, yeah. right? This, this isn't going to get settled just like that. And there may be some brothers and sisters that their journey is going to be a lot longer than yours. Yeah. Um, and we have to love enough to let them go on that journey. I mean, even, even Peter says, uh, or excuse me, I keep saying Peter, but uh, Paul says um, he, when he talks about pressing on towards the goal there in Philippians, right? right. Pressing on towards the goal. Uh, he says everybody who's mature in Christ should think this way. If you're mature, this is how you should think. Right. But if on some point, if anything in my discussion you think differently about, God will make it plain to you. Right. Now, we have to have a lot of trust and faith in that, though, right? Absolutely. But Paul says, God through Paul says, God will make that plain. But live up to what we have already attained. That means we've already attained. We know in good times and bad or bad, in agreement or disagreement, we still have to love each other. Exactly. The way that Jesus loved us. That's how we got to love each other. We still have to bear with one another. Right. right? Long suffering. We still have to. It says love always hopes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. And that's so challenging. But it says love always hopes, always protects. I'm, I'm talking to me. Yeah, that's challenging. Right. Especially when you think the person you're talking across from you that has either they don't get it. They have no idea or they don't want to. Right. Mm, how am I going to handle this one? Go back to point number one, yeah. <laughs> prayer and fasting, right? But that's what love is all about. But so anyway, the, the, lastly, is that this is a process. Yeah. Love each other enough to let us all go through this process together and, and that we're on a journey. And, um, and to have the conviction, we will not let anything divide us. Right. Um, and again, you know, brothers and sisters, this is just... This is uh, the start of many other discussions. And, you know, it'd be great if everything could be healed just from this one discussion. But there's a lot of things we didn't discuss. Uh, there's a lot of things we just didn't have time to discuss or wanted to take the opportunity to discuss. Um, and it's important, again, uh, as Ron shared a little earlier, that the small groups do have this opportunity and take the opportunity to have these discussions. And that's how that's part of how we'll bring our vision statement to life. Right. Um, and that in all of the different communities where uh, disciples live, that they're taking the opportunities in their neighborhoods to have this discussion. And the more victory they have and God says he will be there if we if we have a fast, if we if we have the heart that God is calling us to, he says, you will cry out. And I will say, here I am. That's a promise. God says our righteousness will go in front of us when we have righteous hearts. Um, and then we'll, we'll see that light shine brighter and brighter on our street or around the corner from where we live. But it's important that we have them in, in our communities in the city. And so Ron and I together want to encourage you to have these discussions Believe in God that he is going to meet our needs and he will show up and say, here I am. Um, and I, we look forward to victory winning uh, and for these discussions to happen. And again, we're going to have uh, more discussions like this with different disciples. So stay tuned. Uh, we love you. We pray for you uh, often. And uh, let's give God the glory and the victory in this. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's been good to talk with you here today. It's been great to talk with you, brother. Amen. Amen. <laughs>